Is yes. Okay. So I think we're we're a minute past the official start time, so maybe we can get started, and a few more people will probably join as soon as we do. Uh, so. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, to introduce Martin Savage today. So uh, Martin's been uh, at University of Washington for, for a long time, working at the INC and now at Equus. Um, um, and he's going to tell us some exciting stuff about uh, simulating the Schrodinger model using lots of qubits and even more C naught gates. It's very exciting. So go for it, Martin. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be presenting to you today. Um, please feel free to uh, interrupt and ask questions as we go along. Uh, I'm, as uh, Alexi said, I'm going to tell you about some recent work that we've done uh, since August last year on simulating the Schwinger model using IBM's quantum computers. Um, and uh, the, the reason for this effort, of course, is not to uh, learn more about the Schwinger model. It's important, but to develop the techniques and tools and understandings to be able to go towards three-dimensional quantum field theories uh, Yang Mills uh, and Abelian. And um, there's a number of groups around the world that are putting in significant effort uh, in these directions. And um, the, the reason for that is because uh, if one had access to an ideal quantum computer of ideal capabilities, one will be able to perform simulations of um, quantum field theories and quantum many body systems more generally that are inaccessible to classical computing. I, I don't want to dwell on that too much. The, the, it's a well-known result, particularly for real-time evolution. This is something that is efficient for an ideal quantum computer. And then one has the potential to get to, to explore finite density systems where there's sign problems for Monte Carlo evaluation, but uh, that's not um, always guaranteed. So the work I'm going to tell you about was done with uh, two graduate students, Roland Farrell and Anthony Chavarella. Anthony's now a postdoc in the high energy group at LBNL, and Mark Iller, who's a postdoc um, supported by the Quantum Science Center, one of the NQI centers, um, and he's here at the University of Washington. Um, okay, so let me begin by um, showing you some of the dramatic progress that's happened in quantum simulation and quantum computing during the last year. So, so the last year has really been truly remarkable jump, a real disruptive jump, um, and has taken in, taken the field generally into what IBM has coined the utility era. So before basically the beginning of last year, we were focused, well, the capabilities and algorithms and so forth and devices um, had us sitting performing simulations with below of order 20 qubits. Um, and... The, the idea we didn't, if somebody offered us a million qubits or a, or a, or a hundred qubits or a thousand qubits, um, nobody was really in a position to understand what to do with such capability to address our problems. But then sometime last summer, it was really kicked off, of course, by IBM's progress and the advances in IBM's devices. Uh, and even a challenge issued by IBM is what would you do with a hundred qubits and a hundred gate depth? Um, uh, one saw by August, la end of the summer last year, there were seven groups that had performed simulations on more than 100 qubits. And so you, see, you saw a really uh, a step function from somewhere or below 20 qubits, which had the, the um, Hilbert space dimensionality corresponding to an IBM PC in 1981. Uh, we jumped all the way to the utility scale with 100 qubits, which is beyond you know, far beyond what you can do with a leadership compute facility. And there were seven groups in, in seven different areas. Here's the papers listed over here. So you can see uh, what people have been thinking about with regard to utility scale, the, the now utility scale. Um, they, they span really a set of interesting areas. And one of them was our work on the Schwinger model. Um, but... As I mentioned, IBM had issued this challenge. What would you do if you had a hundred qubits, an ideal quantum computer with a hundred qubits and that could sustain a gate depth of uh, of hundred C naught gates? Um, and so that's what these vertical and horizontal dashed lines are. 
and the seven uh, the seven computations that existed uh, and uh, by the time of the IBM Quantum Summit in New York City in the first week of December, they were sitting um, below a gate depth of two, uh, of 100 and uh, between 100 and 130 qubits. And the work that we did in January uh, took us to a gate depth of 370 on 112 qubits. So we, we were able to blow through this uh, de vertical uh, dashed line by about a factor of four. And so I want to explain how we did this. Um, and that's most of the rest of the talk. Um, uh, it's oh, I was going to say something else here. Uh, I'll come back to it. So the systems. Let me just. Uh, I don't need to really give an introduction to this audience, but the types of environments that we're interested in are uh, we're really focused at the moment, and most people are on dynamical systems, um, non-equilibrium systems. So, for instance. Uh, systems undergoing phase transitions. And this is, of course, on the path from the high energy physics point of view going towards uh, uh, the weak scale barrier genesis, um, looking at the evolution of neutrinos, for instance, in a supernova, that we're, uh, where we don't really, we certainly absolutely do not have the classical simulation capabilities at the moment to accurately describe those, those systems. Although good progress is being making is being made, it's going to require quantum simulations integrated somehow into those simulations to get to where we need to go. And then also, for instance, high energy collisions, uh, such as in a collider like LHC, where one has a small number of high energy particles colliding at high energies, producing a high multiplicity final states. Um, the object, the in principle, a quantum computer. Uh, of sufficient capability should be able to take us from beginning to end on those types of processes. Um, this is a slide, uh, a diagram that I, I took from uh, an article that took it from um, Dan Gottsman. And it explains roughly where we are with regard to quantum simulation and where we're going. So we start with classical computing down here in the lower uh, left. Uh, and we've moved beyond classical computing. Uh, we're in the region called uh, NISC at the moment with noisy intermediate scale quantum devices. Um, and the future trajectory where there's a very large push towards is um, error-corrected quantum com computation. So with error-corrected quantum computation, one should be able to apply the unitary gates with uh, precision, say for instance, 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 22, Whereas at the moment, gate applications uh, in this era devices are uh, a percent or 10 to the minus three to a percent and improving. Um, and in particular, you know, you'll see recently uh, error correcting codes that are being applied on top of NISC devices and so forth, improving the fidelities of operations. But that's at very early stages. Uh, and the, the ideal situation, of course, is zero errors in applications where one should be able to run the quantum computer as one runs a classical computer to, to look at the events like a high energy collision. Um, but there's a lot, an enormous lot, enormous amount to be understood and gained on the path. In particular, we're gonna gain insights, ideas, algorithms, observables on a quantum system that uh, we will need to understand in order to use a fault tolerant quantum computer. It's like, for instance, in the 1970s, if somebody handed you an exascale quantum, uh, an exascale classical computer in the 1970s and asked you to solve QCD, you wouldn't know what to do. So there's an evolution, a sort of a partnership and a hand-in-hand -hand evolution that's going to occur as the devices become more capable and sophisticated. So will the algorithms uh, and the concepts and the ideas and the workflows. So, so this is so I'm quite I'm very hopeful that on the path, as are many people, that on the path towards uh, error-corrected quantum computers, there's going to be a lot of physics that comes out. And in fact, it's, this is going to be necessary development period for us to be able to use a fault-tolerant and an error-corrected quantum computer. Uh, now, this audience um, uh, probably hasn't thought too much about error bars, although I just hear from Alexia uh, that might not be the case. But in, in simulations, classical and, and quantum simulations, understanding errors um, is most of the most of your time and effort, in fact, 
and certainly most of the computational resources. Um, and so uh, 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 one's performing a quantum simulation, there's many sources of error. In present day, we have large device errors. We have theoretical errors in the sense that we have a lattice-sized theory that we wish to take the continuum limit of, we wish to have infinite volume results for, and we're working at a finite lattice spacing, we're working uh, in a finite volume, and so forth. Um, and the really when it comes to simulations and you have a target error that you wish to hit, you have a lot of flexibility in, in fact, changing the theory that you're going to simulate um, you can change it in such a way as long as you come, as long as the final result you can show is below the total error uh, of the error of of the error that you're uh, you're shooting for, and so um, as a result, one is able to perform truncations and organize the theory and organize the algorithm. For instance, there may be a non-perturbative uh, entangled state that you that is BQP efficient for a quantum computer that you um, prepare and then evolve, and then as are able to develop a perturbation theory that sits on top of that to take you to the answer that you're actually, takes you to the theory that you're actually looking to simulate. So one has a lot of freedom, and it's particularly great time for the theorists actually to figure out how, what are the best starting points uh, for quantum simulations. So this is part of what um, we're also doing, and, and um, what made the work that I'm telling you about possible today was um, implementing, um, firstly, the layout of the theory, which is well known and well established, but then implementing uh, a truncation based on the confinement scale, um, naively taking a quantum simulation of the Schwinger model from um, inefficient for a quantum device to, in fact, putting it in the realm of being efficient, but uh, with provably exponentially small errors. So a lot of our time is spent uh, figuring out how we actually map the theory onto the quantum device. The devices today, are, there's a range of them, range of architectures, for instance, trapped ion systems, cold atom systems, superconducting systems, um, and each of them correspond to um, small Hilbert spaces that are connected to each other by some communication fabric. Um, for instance, trapped ion systems, it's an all-to-all -all fabric, but uh, the systems that presently are somewhat limited in the number of qubits that can be su supported, whereas the superconducting systems have nearest neighbor con connectivity, but, they, uh, but many more qubits can be um, assembled, and so on. Uh, the, the trapped ion systems, naively, they're one-dimensional array, but with all-to-all -all connectivities, of course, you can... Um, perform simulations in 2D and 3D uh, with the right algorithms um, and so forth. And so a lot of our time is spent understanding how to map to the devices and, and understand in, in an optimal way to get to the target physics. Uh, the mappings are different on the different devices and for different observables, the mappings are typically also um, different. <clears throat> so when it comes to non-abelian gauge theories, uh, one of the challenges for Yang Mills in particular, is to understand how you organize the truncation in irrep space. If you're using Kogut Suskind, Hamiltonian, how do you actually map the, the, the irreps onto the Hilbert spaces of the quantum device? There's been um, good progress here. The simple systems have been computed, uh, one dimensional systems or quasi two dimensional systems, and there's even efforts. Uh, emerging uh, with a first computation of a three-dimensional cube in issue two that will um, appear shortly. Um, the difference here with between Lagrangian type of uh, traditional classical um, lattice gauge theory simulations and the Hamiltonian formulation is the constraints have to be uh, are included explicitly uh, in the Hamiltonian formulation. And so there's, there's just, it's not that different in the sense, but it's different enough to be challenging. Okay, so uh, moving into the Schwinger model. So the Schwinger model is, uh, is a very interesting test bed. The one-dimensional systems are are uh, really the test the test beds at the moment because the the quantum devices are large enough where one can uh, um, 
perform um, simulations of one-dimensional systems with sufficient number of sites to be meaningful. And uh, being confining and with a fermion condensate, this is of course a, a, a nice model uh, uh, or a test bed for developing algorithms for QCD. Um, and one of the features that hadn't we hadn't really thought about before that uh, made this work possible was, the, was in fact the discrete translation invariance. I mean, it's obvious that it's here in such a theory, but actually implementing it at the level of quantum circuits had, had not been done before. And it, and it wasn't obvious until there was an algorithmic um, advance by Sophia Konamu and, uh, and collaborators of Virginia Tech on uh, developing the, the uh, ADAPT VQE algorithm. So the Schwinger model is interesting, as I said, it's confining, it's got a, a non-zero fermion condensate. It also uh, has nuclei in it. There's a two-body bound state. Uh, and there's also a three-body bound state uh, near threshold. So it's also a place where we can start uh, attempting to do uh, simulations from high energy collisions of single hadrons through to collisions and um, um, low energy collisions, for instance, of small nuclei. Uh, again, it's in 1D. <clears throat> when it comes to the mapping, there's uh, freedom in how one maps to a device. And in fact, uh, there's two different mappings that have really been explored in the literature so far. Uh, one is, uh, and they just correspond to different gauge choices. So one is vial gauge, where one has the, with the staggered mapping of electron positron, electron positron across the lattice, one has the gauge field explicit. So that means that there's either, um, that there's either a bosonic degree of freedom or a, a set of qubits to support the gauge field. And one, ex one has quantum circuits that explicitly interrogate the, those Hilbert spaces in order to evaluate, for instance, the Hamiltonian and to perform time evolution. Uh, one can also work in axial gauge, uh, which is nicer from the standpoint of the number of um, qubits and the number of Hilbert spaces one has to have. It's just equal to the, the, the number of electrons and positrons. Uh, the expense here is that there's a non-local interaction. One has to encode the Coulomb interaction between the the um, electrons and positrons, and that naively scales as volume squared. So the first mapping vol gauge is um, is entirely involves local interactions, uh, but with the Hilbert spaces now for the gauge degrees of freedom, whereas in axial gauge there are just the Hilbert spaces for the electrons and positrons, but there's a non-local volume squared extensive interaction that one has to evaluate. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry question? question. Yeah. Yeah, so so you're adopting here a staggered definition of uh, charge normal ordering, right? Where on even sides, say you have zero or plus charge, and then outside yeah. zero or minus charge. That, right? That's right. That's right. So this uh -huh. is a this is a Jordan Wigner mapping to spins. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's uh, yeah. So so the translation by one side is tricky, right? Uh, that, that that's, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So, in, in fact, uh, I can say some things about that later on when we're looking at the correlator. There was there was a mm -hmm. there was a difference. It, really, it mattered whether you treated observables uh, with regard to staggered sites or spatial sites. Okay. When I say mattered, it was just uh, cleaner and more efficient to use spatial sites. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, the Hamiltonian, as I mentioned, with the, 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 the mapping, the spin system that you map to is actually very simple. Uh, there's a mass term, it's local, with um, acting with power Z's. There's the kinetic energy term, which is uh, raising and lowering operators on adjacent sites across the lattice. And then in uh, axial gauge, one has the non-local interaction of, uh, it's, it's just summing across E squared, but by Gauss's law, E uh, uh, corresponds to an accumulation of charges from one end of the lattice. The charge operator is simple. Again, it's just Z operator and the identity. And we defined, uh, as, as is common, the chiral condensate. We, uh, it's, uh, it's basically a spatial average of the lattice of Zs and identities. And the boundary conditions, uh, <laughs> uh, we, 
the boundary conditions uh, that we have is background electric field zero on either side. This forces the sum of the charges on the lattice to be zero. Um, this was a choice, uh, and um, one can enforce this by pushing, by providing, a, well, adding to the Hamiltonian a very large mass term for the electric field beyond the, beyond the ends of the lattice. This is actually when we do QCD, and I'll say mm -hmm. a couple of words about 1D QCD, that was important in order to be able to actually do the simulation. In, in this condition, it's somewhat uh, less important because it's easy to deal with the abelian charges. So that's the setup. Now, Can one thing to... Question? Yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, why open boundary conditions instead of, say, periodic? Well, so periodic means that you need to connect one qubit, have one qubit on one end talk to the other qubit on the other end. And uh -huh. for, for a device with all-to-all connectivity, that's easy. For a device with nearest neighbor, it's less easy. And so this was simply uh, a convenience to map to the device. I understand. I see. I see. <laughs> so, in a, but in you a, also would need the holonomy variable, right? You you can't just truncate to fermions, right? With periodic. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. You, that's right. You'd have you would have a an integer. You'd have to sum over all of the background fields going through the through the torus. That's right. Right. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, I was going to say something. Yeah, so let, let me let me um, talk about what we did with confinement here. So this is obvious, I'm sure, to everybody here. But uh, confinement means that the charge correlators, the connected charge correlators. Um, fall exponentially once you're outside many um, confinement lengths. Uh, and so what that means when you're evaluating the Hamiltonian that we have here, the electric term, you actually don't need to evaluate all of these terms. Now, I guess the, the point that I actually wanted to make on the slide was if you looked at this Hamiltonian, you can't see by looking at it that it's actually uh, confining. The charges are screened at long distances. It's absolutely not obvious. Um, and so there's an additional input here, and that is physics, the fact that the systems will be confining. And of course, you come you, in, in the vacuum, you can come back and check this, of course, in your calculation. But that changes the evaluation of this term to being something that scales like L squared to uh, scaling as the confinement length times L approximately. You know, there's factors out the front that we haven't computed, but roughly that's the scaling. So it takes uh, so using that additional piece of knowledge, the fact that confinements emerge out of this Hamiltonian, means that you can actually take the system, which is naively not simulatable, to to in fact being simulatable. Of course, you have to come back and check this at the end of the simulation by calculating the charge charge correlator and showing that in fact that it falls exponentially uh, in in the vacuum state in the states that you're looking at. But uh, the, this corresponds to then uh, reorganization of the Hamiltonian and reorganizing terms in a, in a systematic way that corresponds to near to, to the near, to the distance between the charges um, and organize and, and so then truncating so that there's a maximum distance uh, between charges that you um, include in that term in the Hamiltonian and then as you increase that distance you should see then the system um, converge nicely. Don't you have a subtlety in the chiral limit? With this, uh, you... Yeah, yeah, not, not, not thinking about it, not okay, thinking nothing. about the power limit. Yeah. Yep. Um. So what the, what this means is, as far as quantum circuits is, is, how do you build in the correlation? And and on the next slide, I'll show you something um, with regard to scalar field theory. But from a pictorial point of view here, we're actually going to build in the correlation. So we'll start with. Uh, nearest neighbor type correlations from the electric term. So charge, charge, charge contributions from nearest neighbors. And then the next layer, they're further out, further out, further out, further out. And eventually the change that to the uh, any of the low energy observables or the observables of interest is sufficiently small and in fact exponentially small that you can just stop. And so one's going to organize the, one has to lay out the problem onto the quantum computer, and it's convenient just to do it in a lattice where sites correspond to nearest qubits. You know, distance one on the lattice corresponds to the adjacent qubits. 
And then the, the quantum circuits, then the extent of the quantum circuits across qubits, one wants to uh, increase the, the separation between operations to, uh, to the point where you have a convergent result below the error that you're demanding. So um, in 2019, Natalie Plo and I, so Natalie's now an assistant professor at Duke University, we're looking at uh, the vacuum of scalar field theory and trying to implement this, the, uh, you know, basically a physics aware mapping uh, and sets of operations to prepare the vacuum. Um, and, and this upper circuit here that I have upper left corresponds to the most general um, quantum circuit required to uh, create a real wave function on n qubits. So you just these are just correspond to control projections, either projecting to zero or, or predicting to one. So there's two pot so firstly on on theta zero, you want to have a rotation angle. The next one you have two possible rotation angles corresponding to a projection zero or one. The next one's zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one, and so forth. Um, and we did something that on the face of it looked a little um, uh, a step backwards, and that is we reorganized things and wrote this control in terms of um, a, a larger number of operations, but with this triangular shape. And this was so. This was inspired by the fact that if you have this, the, if the one, if this is a lattice corresponding to distance between qubits, then as you move further away, then the controls of the first qubit on the nth qubit should have no effect. And in fact, uh, one can terminate and truncate this expansion in such a way to, to have exponentially converged to where you want to go. And this panel shown here on the lower right corresponds to the angles uh, as a function of the uh, as a function of the control distance. And you see that in fact that is the case. You can actually uh, arrive at exponentially converging uh, truncation here on the circuit. So you can chop. The, the 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 number of qubits involved in any particular operation to get to some desired um, uh, accuracy. And we call these fixed point circuits. And the nice thing about this one is that if you if you have a uh, a set of angles, then um, and you simulate in classically a small volume, then these angles will actually go to a fixed point and they'll be applicable for a much larger lattice. And so you can perform a small simulation, a classical simulation or a simulation on a small quantum device, figure out and compute what these angles are corresponding to these controlled rotations. And because they're exponentially converged, you can then use translation invariance to prepare a, a much, much larger lattice, in, in principle, an infinitely large lattice with only exponentially small errors. And so it was this thinking in mind that uh, we then applied to the Schwinger model. So preparing the vacuum, and I need to keep an eye on the time here. So um, the first thing we did was prepare the vacuum. And we used the, uh, a, a variant. It's basically using exactly the depth VQE algorithm, um, but it's a slight variant thereof, and we, and we called it um, scalable circuit adapt VQE. And uh, just sort of as, for your interest, adapt VQE seems like this is a pretty... Uh, obvious name for an algorithm, but in fact, written down here is exactly what it stands for, which is somewhat non-obvious. Um, and this may be the only time you have to see it. So the idea here is that one uh, identifies a pool of operators to build the state that you want. So one starts with some initial state, uh, and then from the pool of operators, choose one operator, figure out what the gradients are, and then you sequentially go through the whole entire pool figure out what the gradients are of some objective function, which for the Schwinger model is going to be the energy of the vacuum, find the one with the largest gradient, and then um, add that, add the unitary e to the i theta of that operator uh, onto your wave function, and then optimize through um, VQE, optimize that angle to minimize the energy, and then come back, pick another operator, attach it to that circuit, and go through the same process. So there's a pool of operators that you need. You then, in fact, act with the unitary operator. Uh, in the case of the vacuum, where we're going to construct operators that are uh, can scale to arbitrary numbers of sites by <clears throat> by translation invariance, these are operators that don't. These are these are operators with pieces that don't commute, uh, and so there's a trotterization that happens in the application to the circuit. And so there's an opt a further optimization that happens um, in the process. But at the end of the day, 
It's just, it's a classical optimization that happens to determine angles in a sequence of operators that are pulled from this pool. The important thing here is, is it's all classical. Because of the finite correlation length, uh, at least for reasonable lattice spacings, if you, the caveat is if you go to very small lattice spacings, you need to go to a quantum computer, but for reasonable lattice spacings, then you can perform these simulations and this optimization on a classical computer to determine the angles in the circuit uh, with exponentially, uh, with exponential precision. So in this pool, because you have dealing with a system that actually has boundaries, you have the open boundary conditions, there's operators that are both volume scaling operators, but also operators that are localized around the boundaries. And one has to include these in the selection process in, in determining the ADAPT VQE quantum circuit. So one performs classical simulations over a range of volumes, L, from say six or seven up to say uh, 20 or 30, uh, using for instance, uh, a laptop or a, or a large cluster. And then one can go to things like DMRG and uh, tensor networks to uh, go to much larger systems. Um, and once one has those results of classical simulations, one is able to then um, perform the exponential fit, determine these angles as a function of volume, and then have a circuit that you can then put directly onto a quantum computer. And so that's what we did. Um, so the, to give you some idea, I'm not going to dwell on this, to give you some idea of what the operators look like. They're pretty straightforward. They're operators in the Hamiltonian, but generalized to arbitrary separations. And of course, with the necessary um, Z operations between the, the fermion fields. Um, it, so if one applies the, the E to the I of these operators, then of course, one will go from a real initial state to a complex wave function. And, and so what we did was use, in fact, the commutators of these operators. And these commutators are such that if you take the exponential of them, they'll give you take you from a real initial state to a real final state. And so that's, uh, that's what we wanted to have is a real final state wave function. And so we use these commutators. Um, yeah, let me make a further comment. And that is the initial state we chose was strong coupling vacuum. <clears throat> and, and the reason for that, and, it, and there are a number of choices one could have made, but the strong coupling vacuum has the right behavior in the infrared. And uh, consequently, any of the quantum circuits that you develop ha will have operator structures that are, again, localized within the confinement uh, region or, or nearabouts. Um, but, uh, but if you have a very large system, you don't want to be having to perform quantum operations on the entire system. You want to be able to initialize into a state that's corrected long distances and then perform localized operations over some region and then translate that across the entire lattice to initialize the vacuum. So that's what we did. Now, strong coupling is also somewhat, um, seems a little odd because then you have to go from a coupling constant of infinity down to the coupling constant that you're targeting. But it turns out that uh, the, the, strong cup, the strong coupling and the vacuum with hopping term equals zero is the same. And it turns out that is much easier to work with, at least with adiabatic preparation, is to start from the strong coupling with zero kinetic energy and then adiabatically turn on the kinetic energy term or the hopping term. So as far as the quantum circuits are concerned, uh, these are what they look like. There was some algorithm developments over the last couple of years that uh, from the quantum chemists and uh, that uh, organize the circuits in a very nice way in terms of these uh, cross circuits where one has an operator uh, on one qubit and then there's a z-string between that and the other qubit. And so these circuits in the upper left correspond to being um, uh, at least optimal for this problem. So for instance, this uh, R plus or minus theta gate that's here in, in uh, the sub diagram A corresponds to applying e to the i theta over 2 xy minus yx and so forth. And so you can assemble these together in the circuit below on the lower left. And with one layer, uh, the first volume operator, it actually compresses quite nicely into just, this is just application of the hopping term from one side of the lattice to the other. The next one, diag sub diagram B, you see that there's cancellations as we've highlighted by these red dash boxes between different legs of these uh, of these cross diagrams. And again, that 
collapses, you see that there's holes uh, in the circuit. And then once you do the collapse, it actually collapses into a nice dense uh, set of layers. And then one goes to a, the, a, a, an operator with greater extent, greater numbers of Z operators between the X and the Y. And again, there's cancellations uh, and it collapses. There's a lot of open space here. And these again collapse to a much more dense circuit. And so when you're working with a, a machine with a finite uh, lifetime or a finite coherence time, having all of the operations be able to be applied as, as quickly as possible uh, is important. Um, a lot of white space here corresponds to the machine de decohering significantly more than a circuit where there's no white spaces. And so one of the optimizations is to compress these circuit operations into the smallest number of layers as possible. Now, in addition, there's a trotterization that happens in the application of the unitaries, and there's a further optimization that happens. So if I have a circuit, for instance, the... Um, the the, uh, the 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 precursor to the green circuit figure A here, and I'm looking now at the upper uh, right. Then one can have the operators ap uh, appear as a depth two circuit or depth three, depth four, all the way to depth seven. These are all a trotterized implementation of the same operator, but they have quite different characteristics. Uh, the one on the right is a is a quite a deep circuit. The one on the left is a shallow circuit. But the quantum correlations of the of the depth two circuit are, uh, are, are limited in how far they go across the lattice compared to the one that's depth seven. So there's a trade-off in the fidelity of the wave function that you prepare versus circuit depth. And so that's another optimization that happens in preparing these circuits. And you can see here in the lower right, the, 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 um, the um, error in the energy, depending on how this um, circuit arrangement and, and trotterization is implemented. Um, this, uh, I, this is just to show you that, in fact, it was, it's consistent with exponential convergence. Of course, you can't prove it's exponential convergence, but over the, over the, the, the depths of circuits we've looked at, it appears to be exponentially converging. And here, this table on the right is to demonstrate that there's a sequence of operators. So here, you have volume, 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 surface, volume. And as you get a larger and larger volumes, you expect the surface operators to become less and less significant uh, as they become a less significant part of the lattice itself. And that's in fact what you see. There's a transition point here, for instance, at L equals nine, where there's a, the volume operator becomes more important, volume seven, compared to the surface operator. And so things are working in the optimization as you expect them to work. And I'll skip that. So one of the... Um, one of the developments over the last couple of years that made this possible was um, this uh, mitigation strategy called decoherence renormalization. This came out of the, the high energy group uh, at uh, Berkeley in, in collaboration with IBM. And then there's also a very nice paper out of York University on um, self-mitigating trotted circuits for issue two lattice gauge theory. <clears throat> and um, this works really well. And if you look at, so the, if you focus here on the upper uh, right panel, you see two sets of data. One is from a mitigation circle, a circuit. So the physics circuit, for instance, is a set of operations and angles you apply to some initial state to take you to the quantum state after some time in time evolution. <clears throat> and it involves non-zero angles, uh, as an example. And you'll measure something, for instance, like the probability of, of remaining in the vacuum, the vacuum to vacuum persistence amplitude, for instance. And these correspond to these uh, red points and blue points uh, the, with regard to the solid and the dashed lines. Now, one can also then apply the circuit, the same circuit, but with zero angles. And so what this does is, and you measure again, the probability of being in the, in the remaining in the vacuum. And what this does is it provides a measure of decoherence of the device. So as part of this, you take your Pauli gates, your, sorry, you take your c naught gates, you twirl them, um, turning coherent errors into statistical errors, and then you perform large volume, large ensemble averaging. And you see that that produces these exponential, this exponential envelope to these results. So there's the physics circuits providing these oscillating results and the mitigation circuits, which are the physics circuits, but with zero angles, are providing these, this exponential envelope. 
And because, and so this is a direct measure of the decoherence of the device. And so you can use it to rescale the observable you're interested in. So if you rescale, um, the, basically rescale this amplitude uh, with regard to this exponential envelope, then you see the results that occur in this lower panel that um, when you compare them with the, the expectations agree remarkably well. So even beyond um, 200 C naught gates where the, the uh, physics amplitudes look like they basically converged, you can actually pull out signal and uh, find results. They're not perfect, but it's actually a major improvement. It took, a, it took the field from being able to apply circuits with say about 30 C naught gates before the device um, effectively disappeared to be able to work with 300 and 400 C naught gates. So, so this is looking at the overall probability of the vacuum to vacuum persistence amplitude. Um, but this is something that's actually not going to scale well as we go to very large numbers of qubits. And the reason for that is because um, as, you, as you go to a large number of qubits, there's, cer uh, there's certainly going to be some of them that uh, undergo an error, sustain an error. And so that will take you away from, the, uh, away from your initial target state. And so one has to think a little bit differently and work with local error mitigation. And so that's something else that we did here that also made our results possible is to think about how you do an experiment. You work in a laboratory and you don't really care about what happens in the rest of the city or in another city around the world. It doesn't matter. You just need to have control and uh, measurements and normalizations that you uh, that are robust uh, in, a, in a limited volume of, of space and time. And so on the quantum device, uh, we took that to the extreme and we're looking at relatively local observables, chiral condensate, uh, one qubit observables, or two qubit observables. And so we mitigated the circuit uh, in such a way to reproduce known values for those observables in the mitigation circuit. So we didn't try and look at a global quantity, we looked at a local quantity. Again, it required uh, what the Pauli twirling that I mentioned and running interleaved uh, uh, mitigation circuits between physics circuits and the workflow, and at the end of the day, it was able to rescale to the physics observables. Okay. So, uh, what you see here in the left panel is the charge-charge correlator, the connected one. Um, and the, the reason I say connected is if you look in the, in the right panel, you see the expectation value of charge uh, as a function of lattice site, and because of the open boundary conditions, it's not zero, uh, the charge density is not zero everywhere. There's a sort of an exponential, a small exponential rise towards uh, each of the boundaries. So um, one's positive and one's negative so that the entire system remains electrically neutral. Um, so when you subtract that off, when you form this correlation function, indeed you find the results from the quantum computer uh, follow what you would expect with an error bars. Now, uh, these error bars on these points towards uh, at, at D equals four, five, and six are large enough because it's a log plot, large enough to be consistent with the results of the classical simulation. But uh, with the truncations that we implemented, we would, it, it, uh, the, the errors behaved as they should have behaved. So these are the results from the quantum computer. This is using 127 Eagle processor. We ran on 100 qubits. Uh, this is the chiral condensate. The, um, squares correspond to the results from the quantum computer and the points correspond to the results after the error mitigation that I just described. We worked on IBM Cusco, so this was a, a, an Eagle processor. We ran with 100 qubits, 150 twirls, uh, uh, and each twirl had uh, 8,000 shots. Uh, and there's more details that one could give that you can ask me about. But nonetheless, the result here is that on a system with 100 qubits, one's actually able to prepare the vacuum of the Schringer model uh, consistent with classical expectations uh, at, at basically the percent level with the, with the approximations that we use. So onto wave packets uh, and dynamics. So um, what we want to do here is to prepare the vacuum. And of course, we prepared the vacuum everywhere uh, through, on, everywhere throughout the lattice. And so to prepare a wave packet of hadrons, we only want to be able to operate in a, in a limited region where the wave packet has support and not worry about modifying what goes on outside of that wave packet region. And so the protocol then is to prepare 
the vacuum of the Schwinger model, and then to develop and arrive at quantum circuits to prepare a wave packet, but over some limited uh, ra range of limited support, and then time evolve that system forward with the same with the Hamiltonian with the appropriate truncations. <clears throat> and so we took a variant of what uh, Jordan Lee and Preskill did in scalar field theory. We started on the strong. So we we had to uh, firstly create the wave packet with a classical simulation before we prepared the circuits. So we did that using JLP protocol, uh, a variant of it. We created a, an exit, a mesonic excitation uh, on top of the strong coupling vacuum and then adiabatically evolved into the, um, uh, into the, with the target mass and target coupling. So we actually had a wave pack and it was a little bit non-trivial. There was some forwards and backwards movement that we had to do. We had to cut some of the links for some period of the evolution and then turn them back on and restore them. But at the end of the day, we then created through an optimization, a single hadron wave packet. So then when you let it go and time evolved it, you produced a single hadron propagating left or a single hadron propagating right. And then using the same uh, adapt algorithm for creating the quantum circuits, we then, we then created operations on top of the quantum vacuum to minimize the infidelity of the state with regard to the wave packet. Um, this was straightforward application of the same algorithm as before, except that one didn't have translationally invariant, uh, one didn't have, um, I wasn't going to say that right, we didn't have operators that of course span from one side of the lattice to the other side, they were localized, uh, and so it was a bit noisier in the operation, but nonetheless one could prepare a wave packet um, with about, with some, some percent precision. And um, again, so the quantum circuits had to then be developed for the evolution of the system. The truncation of the Hamiltonian was as I described it before. Um, and then we also had to map that truncation onto the IBM device, which only has nearest neighbor connectivity, which meant gate structures such as these uh, um, crosses of the RZ operations had to be reduced to C not gates and single qubit operations across the uh, across the device, which is which we were able to do. To compare the systematic approximations, this is all classical. This is not on the device. The upper left is the exact result that we were seeking under time evolution of 14 trotter steps. The lower right corresponds to the result obtained with all of the truncations and approximations that we implemented. And you see that uh, to better than a percent level, in fact, uh, one reproduces what you expect for the time evolution. So this is, again is the, the chiral condensate. So the truncations that were implemented was two layers of the SCADAT VQE, a truncated electric Hamiltonian, and second order trotter, trotterization of the operators. Um, this is a uh, condensate for what mass of the- Oh formula? yeah, so this is for point, point 0.1 and coupling of point 0.8. Uh -huh. okay. Yes. Yep. So, uh, you know, that's a, that's a good point because uh, one's going to want to go towards the continuum limit and reduce the ladder spacing. Um, so then, you know, more quantum resources are going to be required, larger partitions and so forth. So that is something to, that is something that's going to have to be addressed in the near future. Mm -hmm. So the production details on IBM's Torino. So this was a Heron processor. So this is a better processor than the Eagle processor. Uh, it has uh, reduced crosstalk and so forth and gate applications. Um, and the largest 14 trotter step required 14,000 C not gates and a depth of 370. Um, uh, the, and if you look at the total number of C knots executed, it was over a trillion for this production. Uh, and the total number of shots we applied was 154 million. And what made this possible was the fact that any, you know, all of us that have done um, simulations on, on high performance computing systems, the big ones, know that there's a, the week between Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, the queues are essentially empty. And so the same is true, it turns out, for IBM's quantum computers. And so we were able to get a significant fraction of the, of the IBM, um, of IBM Torino during that week. And we, pre we prepared for it in anticipation mm -hmm. of that being the case. So otherwise, this would have taken much longer than uh, than it did. 
So here's the side by side result. The left hand side is what you expect classically. So this is arbitrary precision result. Uh, and the right hand side is what we obtain with IBM's um, quantum computer Torino. Um, you see that as you increase the number of time steps, the, the, the results from the quantum computer became a bit noisier. This is what the speckles here are uh, uh, away from the wave packet evolution. But you see that the wave packet evolution, uh, while not perfect, actually is, is consistent with what you expected from classical simulations. So this is a big, this is a big um, quantum simulation with 112 qubits and depth 370. And you can actually obtain physics from it. So that's the big takeaway message from um, this diagram, this plot. So as a side-by-side -side comparison, um, here are what the results look like in the wave packet evolution. Um, you see the, the, the black lines correspond to the MPS simulator. The um, circles correspond to what came off IBM's quantum device. You see the comparison, it's not perfect. There's clearly underestimated, we have underestimated some or not accounted for some of the systematic errors here. The, the limitations are not statistical. The statistical errors are included in these plots. And so we haven't done perfect error mitigation. So there's more work to do there, but the takeaway message here is that it looks pretty good. You, at least qualitatively, these are in agreement. Um, as you, you also see that as you increase time, the results become rougher and rougher, or the, the they um, start uh, bouncing around a bit more. Uh, the error bars grow, uh, but nonetheless, even after fourteen uh, time steps, one has qualitative agreement. Now, um, this looks great. If you look at where this came from, um, it's it's pretty interesting as to how one of those emerged. So, for instance, for T equals nine, and this is true for all of them. What's shown here is the result from the MPS simulator, the horizontal lines, and then the results are from the device. So the upper left here is the chiral condensate as a function of lattice. Um, and you see that it's basically flat across the device, whereas what you expect from the MPS simulator has non-trivial structure to it. The result in the vacuum state is similar. And when you do the subtraction, you see that the result from the device and the result from the MPS simulator look quite different. They don't look like they're in agreement uh, at all, in fact. But one has to do the error mitigation. So one does the operator decoherence renormalization, as shown in the second <laughs> row. One then also does a filtering that is of some qubits way off from where you expect where you expect it to be from the strong coupling vacuum, cut it out. And then symmetrizing the fact that the lattice can be reflected. There's a CP symmetry. Then you put it all together and you end up in this lower right panel where you're finding good agreement between the MPS simulator uh, and the quantum computer. So without error mitigation, we would have concluded that there was no signal, but once you accommodate the fact the device is decohering and um, putting, in, uh, putting in accounting for extremities or extreme um, events in the simulation, then you can actually do quite well. So I don't have much time left. I was just going to make a comment on QCD, quick one. So we did simulations last um, 18 months ago in QCD. We didn't have any of that technology available. And so we could do two sites of two flavor QCD. Um, but this was very interesting because it actually um, uh, allowed us to really prepare, uh, prepare in many ways conceptually for doing what I just showed you. Um, so we actually, the, the next step, of course, from the Schringer model is to go, is return to QCD and start simulating aspects of QCD. We wrote two papers. One was creating the vacuum and looking at time evolution, looking at the mappings, understanding, uh, understanding trotterization and what it does to color charges. Um, and it is different. Issue three and higher is different from U1 and issue two. And then we were also able to, to put in uh, electroweak operators. So we did a, 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 a very small volume simulation of a single baryon beta decay in real time. So the results we got off for the vacuum, the vacuum to vacuum persistence amplitude at that time, very small simulation, seven qubits. Um, but with the error mitigation at the time, we were able to actually recover with high precision 
the persistence amplitudes, the time dependence. Again, Pauli twirling played an important role. We were able to make then estimates of what uh, the expected gate counts would be in issue three. These are off now by, we, we understand now how to drop these, reduce these costs substantially. But now the fact we can actually sustain more than 10,000 C0 gates means we, we're in the region here of doing two flavor with probably 10, uh, L equals 10 with two flavors in 1D. So it's starting to get into the, mm -hmm. into the situation of being able to do real things in QCD. Um, again, this is work in process, progress. We learned, uh, in fact, uh, we looked at what the meson wave functions were in, in this 1D QCD simulation as a function of coupling. And we saw the transition from the mesons being um, predominantly QQ bar states to being predominantly baryon anti baryon states. As the coupling gets strong, each site wants to be a color singlet, so it turns into a baryon. So that was actually uh, an interesting piece of physics there, and it was diagnosed by looking at the entanglement entropy. And then in the beta decay, we were able to start looking at and understanding at least what it's going to take to recover, for instance, a lifetime of a of a complex nucleus, uh, not a, you know, of a pro of a neutron or a or a composite uh, in uh, hadron in the Schrödinger model, or in, sorry, in in QCD and what it would take to actually recover an exponential decay. And of course, one's moving from uh, oscillating uh, probabilities to uh, you know, a, a, a coherent sum of a large number of oscillatory terms that conspire to give you an exponential decay. And of course, on the lattice, you'll, any, you'll, with any finite volume, you'll not recover purely exponential decay. You'll recover some uh, interval that approaches exponential decay, but then starts oscillating again. And we were able to perform a simulation on uh, Quantinium's trapped iron quantum computer, the one with 20 qubits, and got results that were actually completely consistent with what we expected to see. Okay, so to summarize, um, quantum simulations are essential for advancing our capabilities of simulating uh, quantum field theories, particularly the dynamics and hopefully finite density systems. Uh, the one plus one dimensional systems, the Schwinger model, a one plus one dimensional QCD are playing a critical role in the at the moment in uh, us developing our conceptual understanding how to use quantum computers. Um, you know, really trying to implement and exploit the quantumness and the entanglement capabilities of these devices in ways that one doesn't think about in doing lattice QC classical lattice QCD simulations. Uh, and the physics, you know, understanding the physics of these systems. Um, is important in understanding how to arrange the mappings and the truncations and the uh, and uh, the quantum circuits themselves. Um, so primarily here, I discussed the introduction of the scalable quantum circuits. Those are um, those are going to play a key role for going forward in in one and two and three and arbitrary numbers of dimensions. Um, and I showed you our results. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin, for a wonderful talk. Uh, are there any questions from, from anybody in the audience? Feel free to just jump in. So, so question. So, so in one plus one dimensions, you just got rid of the gauge fields, but of course, in higher dimensions, you will not be able to do that. So, so to what extent does that complicate things? Yeah. So this is something that hasn't really been pushed on really at all, but people are now starting to think about it. Um, it's really only became it only really became obvious that it was a gauge choice that that changed the mapping from vial gauge to axial gauge. Um, in high dimensions, of course, uh, one has gauge choices to make too, and understanding uh, the gauge choice to make will probably depend on the observable you're interested in. So you can imagine if you're interested in traversing some given direction in your two-dimensional lattice, you go to the gauge with the gauge field where there's no parallel transporters in that direction, they're all in another direction. And that might be the that might make your life easier. It just depends on, it's going to depend again on the processor, uh, on the on the quantum architecture. But <laughs> that's something that but that, that's really that's a good question because it's something that only just stand to be thought about. But but also the holder space will need to be much bigger because of all these gauge fields. I mean, so then <laughs> it'll be truncated somehow for them. And absolutely. So so there's been work. 
so we've done quite a bit of work on this, but others have too uh, many groups actually on understanding um, particular not just Yang Mills in particular, what are the truncations in the in the gauge space that you want to do? One, there's two real, there's three, probably three different approaches. One is truncating the irreps using in the Kogut Suskin basis. So that one, that one's actually relatively straightforward to understand how to do it. If you look at, for instance, in low dimensions, you find you know, Gaussian type convergence, it looks like a harmonic oscillator. Uh, in higher dimensions, it's going to be worse. One can also think about using, you know, going into the conjugate basis and discretizing the, the gauge variables. And so people have been exploring that also using crystal groups and so on. Um, there's no right answer at the moment. No, There's no clear winner. And so all of them are being pursued at the moment to see how far you can go. I mean, I should also say that's just generically true here. There's no clear winner which path to, which path is going to take us there. So there's a lot of room for scoping out and quantifying what it's going to take and a lot of room for formal development, in fact. If you had used vial gauge, yeah. you would have had to carry around the gauge fields. And yes. at least it's an easier setting to try that than higher dimensions. Is anybody trying to... Do it the hard way, but in one plus one, just to develop the yeah. So, so the work some of yes. So absolutely. So in fact, my, many of the resource estimates for the Schringer model have been done in file gauge. So where you have an explicit degree of freedom, and you look at the operations and what it's going to take to perform simulations there. Now, I'll come back to it. But one of the interesting things is if you look at uh, if you choose those two, if you just quantify in both gauges, and you ask what it would take to time evolve a system of length L forward, L trotter steps, basically, it's the same resource requirement, mm -hmm. which was quite surprising. So the, there's the amount of quantum resources to take that volume, do some physics and you know evolve that physics forward in time is roughly, the, it's the same scaling independent of gauge. It's just where do you put those resources differs. Now, so there's been work and developments, particularly uh, Zura Davuti's group in Maryland have been looking at using, uh, you know, vibration, the vibrational modes of trapped iron systems, for instance, to, to keep to be the, the keepers of the gauge field or where the gauge field lives. And that's, that's, you know, that's very interesting. It's a bosonic degree of freedom. And so the trapped ions are then the fermions and the vibrational excitations can be used as the, um, uh, as the, gauge fields. And so so people have, it's not just that group, there's other groups, groups in Europe that have been trying to figure out how to do these mappings with, with success. So I haven't seen an actual implementation on a quantum computer yet of those. But, you know, these, these devices are evolving all the time. They have capabilities and uh, I, I suspect that will become, that will be a viable approach to go forward also. Yeah, I, I have a couple of questions, uh, comments. Like, so one thing I found interesting is the role that the strong strong coupling uh, state, strong coupling limit plays. Uh, yeah, we actually, historically, people tried to do strong coupling expansion and had some mixed luck with it. But recently in, uh, in our work with Silvio, uh, Ross Dempsey and Bernardo Zahn, we, we obtained very good convergence of strong coupling expansion provided that the mass is properly defined. Like, for example, we can reproduce the mass of the Schwinger boson very precisely. So, I, given, given what we've seen, and uh, my, our slice, I think, is much less deep than yours, uh, I think there's room for doing more there to help initialize and uh, the quantum simulations. One, one needs a good starting point. You really want to minimize the load carried by mm -hmm. the computer. And so doing as much analytically and classically uh, is, is just better. Yeah, because one thing one can do is just to say in two plus one dimensions, work out the strong coupling expansions and and see what that gives. That's sort of the historic approach of the many years ago. 
and compare that with uh, quantum simulation. And another comment is, uh, have you tried the two flavor Schwinger model? I think it has some very interesting new effects compared to one flavor one. It's... So uh, uh, classically, yes, we've, we've played with it. We haven't put on a, a device. Uh, now that the devices are sufficiently capable, we can go back and try and put that onto the device. We're, we're actually mm -hmm. thinking now about heavy systems with um, basically heavy, the second flavor being very heavy mm -hmm. and doing heavy quark type physics where, where one has control of location. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of what we're focused on now, but increasing the number of flavors in the Schwinger models, mm -hmm. yeah, it's interesting. Martin, I remember you saying that you haven't thought much about the chiral limit in the one flavor case, but yeah. Did anything special really happen in, I mean, uh, the, in the, normally the chiral limit has all kinds of issues, uh, yeah. but I'm not sure that they really affect you here. So for example, you might think that there might be some divergent correlation links in the chiral limit, but that's, I don't think that's going to be true here because the model still has a gap and it's deconfined, but the, but precisely because it's deconfined in the chiral limit, the, you know, the, the charge correlators will still decay exponentially. Well, I, really, I'll tell you why. why yeah, so I can tell you where I got to my comment from. I mean, it was basically how do you prepare the initial state to work from? So in M equals zero, um, you know, you, the, the, it's far from the strong coupling. But, you know, having a non-zero, zero coupling, having a mass puts you into this anti-ferromagnetic ground state. And when mass is uh, equal to zero, it's, it's not that. And I, so it was, it's basically a mechanic, it was entirely a mechanical and non-physics driven choice where, I, where we've not really considered M equals zero. Now, everything you said is true. In principle, one can come back uh, now that we understand how to do these things and turn the mass small. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it was basically a mechanical problem in some mm -hmm. ways. Uh, I think to, to get the chiral limit, you don't need to send uh, to set the lattice mass parameter to zero. There is this uh, mass shift that. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. The, the, yeah, that that works yeah. much better than setting it to zero. So this is your work on uh, the correction. Yeah. Yeah. There is. Uh, it gives an exact kind of symmetry of the lattice section under shift by one unit and and shift of theta by pi that uh... okay so so I, I we know about this work and and decided not to implement it until we got some progress but got further down the road but it might be a good time to look at that again yeah um, martin have you thought about uh different uh vqes to play with now that you have this uh uh you know you have this nice test bed with 100 qubits and well, there are improvements in one compared to the other that would be significant. Um, we, we have really not put much time and thought into that. Um, uh, you know, we, this was basically an existence proof that you could do it with, with this VQE. Um, but it, it required some, it required some tuning and particular coefficients of the operators and so forth. So it wasn't just out of the box. So there is room for, there's certainly room for improvement and and looking at what other algorithms will also get you there would be a good thing to do. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? Okay, well, if not, let me stop recording.